are live. Hello to all my guys, gals, and non-binary pals of Audio Podcast Land. And welcome to an exciting episode of the Biconics Wrestling Podcast, where four random dudes on the internet decide to talk about wrestling and all things related to it. We're going to have some laughs. We're going to have some tears. There's going to be a little bit of arguing, but you know what? Just like the wrestling fandom, everybody is fickle. I am so excited to be bringing this project to you live. But of course, as always, I'm not alone in my endeavor. But before I get to my co-hosts, my name is Mikey. I am one of the Biconic hosts. You can follow me all over the internet, Pop Culture Geek. You can also follow us at Vibe Tribe Productions, where we have a plethora of projects going on, which is a lot. But if you haven't already, make sure you give us a like and follow to stay up to date on everything that we got going on. Like I mentioned, I am not alone tonight. I am joined by my three lovely co-hosts. So we're going to go around, introduce themselves, and then we're just going to jump straight into it. So first person to give us their little introduction is going to be Minnie. What's up, guys? Minnie Moss, 2211. My name is Evan. You can jump in on social media. Same thing. I'm all over this Vibe Tribe stuff. You can catch me in two other games, three maybe, if I'm lucky, but... So. <laughs> Love to see it. Next person up is JVL. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Van Luling. I am also in part of the Vibe Tribe Productions here in the Call of the Deep podcast, but I also have been watching wrestling for a long time and I'm glad to be here. You can check me out on Negative H13 or the JV Lexicon and all the socials or just leave me the hell alone because I'm old and I'm just crotchety. We love it. And of course, last but certainly not least is John. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any solstice you want to plug? No, nah, leave me the fuck alone. My name's John Crossway. I'm a voice actor and theater teacher up here in Northern California. You can type in John Crossway and find me on socials and miscellany. I am on a handful of podcasts here at the d Vibe Tribe and a lot of things coming up in the following year. So check those out. And I've been, I was watching, I watched a lot of wrestling when I was a kid. So I was lucky. I was born in 83, so I was like four, five, six at the peak of the late 80s Hulk Hogan madness and tag teams and stuff like that. Watched, actually, don't judge me, I watched a lot of WCW in the 90s. That was my thing, and then the Attitude Era won me over, and I was hitting people with chairs and improv shows when I was in high school. So I watched oh, a lot do? of wrestling. Say what? You too? Oh, you too? thing! If you, were yeah. doing, if you were doing improv in the late 90s and you were in high school, you were hitting people with chairs. Especially going to hit bomb chairs. Yeah, scene wasn't going well. You just grab a chair, bang! It was great. You had a folding chairs from most of it because unless you had those big wooden ones that hurt people, you knew how to hit them right and it made a big yeah. sound. Yeah, all the time. Like you would do the forty-five degree angle thing, so you hit the ground, not them, and just freak people out. Oh my god! Well, no, I just got hit by the chair. Yeah. Say what? It's got hit by the chair. It's surface area. You put your hands up, and it's all. And you still get hit by fucker, but. But some people bust out on you, and then they like back up as they had the chair. So then you're like chasing them with the chair, and then it just look down. So That's very Hulk Hogan in the '80s, though, chasing someone with a chair and barely tapping them. So that makes sense. Yeah. There's a video of that where it's just Hulk Hogan. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. Sorry, chairs, Mikey. Man. I'm plugging somebody else's channel. But it's the thing where it's Hulk Hogan can't use a chair. And yep. it's just him trying to hit people with a chair and just fucking it up. It's like, come on, huh, come on. Tapping him, missing him. Human. Oh my goodness. I'm oh, so this happy. Gonna be, this, this is going to be incredible. Oh, uh, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm so excited to have my co host here for this project. This is going to be great. And since we're already started on the topic, a lot of us, as if you cannot tell already, the four of us have an extensive history when it comes to professional wrestling. Some of us have seen many iterations of professional wrestling over the last couple of years decades take your pick and some of us are fairly new to it so before we jump into everything that we're going to discuss tonight we should give a little bit of a brief rundown of our history with professional wrestling so i guess i'll go first since i have to be the fearless leader here you can be a fearful leader that's fine there's plenty of those out there yeah put them up oh my gosh Invade, I, a, invade a smaller country and blame that country. That's all you have to do. Ooh, too real. Anyways. <laughs> oh, boy. Literally shots fired. Literally <laughs> shots fired. Oh, my God. Shots fired. Just, Jokes on you. <laughs> you can also just petition the Idaho Council to be able to, like, annex part of Oregon. You're all set. Oh, my goodness. Anyways. Oh, Idaho. Is there anything they can do? Ooh. ooh. Oh, Mikey, go. Go, Mikey, go. (laughs) So really, just not to spend too much time on it. My brief history with wrestling is 
I didn't know exactly what it was until maybe I got into high school. This is like 2009, 2010 is when I started watching WWE and watching the pay-per-views. And then I dipped off when I went to college and it wasn't on, it wasn't until maybe the last seven, eight years that I've gotten back into it. And now with the state of the wrestling companies out there, I feel like they're, we're spoiled for choice when it comes to certain things. But we'll talk about it tonight because I had some fun parts this year and there were some things I was like, maybe we should leave that in 2022. But I'm, I have a pretty good enough history. I'm more I grew up more with the modern wrestling state as it is. So your John Cena's, the Dave Batista's like the early 2000s is when I went back. And then once I got more and more into it, then I went back and did my research and watched some of the older stuff. And I was like, OK, I'm. The, I'm more of the historian type, but I'm also up to date on the current things as well. But yeah, so that is my brief introduction in terms of my history with wrestling. Minnie, why don't you go up next? Because yours is very interesting. I am the, the youngest of the group, so I started wrestling, watching wrestling when I was four back in 2002. Oh, man, that hurt. Oh, God damn. Yeah, back when, right before, I think it was two or three weeks before Cena debuting officially. So I started watching towards the Ruthless Aggression, and so I started really hardcore into it. Get back. my walker, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to take a back pill. Damn. Ugh. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the right one, but uh, former uh, athlete that I did uh, football, and I did amateur wrestling, so I did try to be cool in the wrestling, and it you know, never really worked. Uh, I've been watching wrestling for 20 years now, give or take. Uh, it's been falling off because of issues in my life. I haven't really started picking it back up until this year when I joined, I joined the Vibe Tribe and I was kind of like, hey, you know, I'm going to wrestle to my face. Oh my goodness. I love it. I love it. Love it. Since shots were fired, I guess we go to our more life experience members. So JVL, you can go ahead next. You know, back in my day, we didn't uh, say things to our uh, elders here. We, we brought guns and knives into the back of the backstage, and we beat up Bruiser Brody in Puerto Rico, and we took, no. Yeah, we just uh, shot people for the championship. <laughs> and then they came back as undead wizard men. It was weird. It's easy to pin a sound bitch when you shoot them. Like, exactly. He won't move at all. Kicks out after 10. Real coffin matches. They were coffins. <laughs> I went with Inferno matches. It was easier to make sure we had a cremation of everybody. There's no evidence there. Hey, you save money on that. Exactly, except for the pooping. I'm about as old as the professor is, and I got into wrestling like in those Halcyon days too, like early Hulk Hogan, early WWE, where all that stuff. Watched on and off when I was very young. Was definitely into the whole big like superheroes as they were, and fought, and was very like t- taken along by my nose and shown where to go and loved early undertaker and all that stuff and kept watching all the way up through high school that was when for me that was the attitude era kicked off so i was watching through then love bret hart all that good stuff and then get into stone cold and i would tape the matches and my friend and i would watch like a month worth of them up to the pay-per-view like at his house after school one day and really got into it there and then did theater more and did a bunch of other stuff more went and then fell in with girls and realized that I didn't want to watch wrestling as much as hang out with girls. So I ended up doing that or and guys too at the same time. And so Ruthless Aggression really wasn't my age. I went to college, didn't watch for a long time. I couldn't see John Cena. So there was no reason for me to worry about that. And so I just made my way through there until I saw Chick Magnet Punk come onto the scene and enjoyed him. He brought me back a little bit. And then when I moved out to Chicago, I found a lot of improvisers in Chicago who are huge wrestling nerds. And of course, Chicago being the hotbed of independent wrestling, it was got dragged right back into it, including seeing so many with so many shows with friends of mine in the burlesque community who did stuff with the, with all the wrestling stuff out there. It was huge. So that got me back in right around 20, 2009, 2010. And then I've been kind of like ever since flying through straight in my pants, so everything loved there and I've been enjoying it ever since for what it was and shitting on Vince McMahon for everything I can. I'm missing anything. Oh, I like the professor also. I did watch WCW. I used to be that guy that would like on Thursdays would flip between SmackDown and Thunder to be able to catch the right things at the right times. And same thing with Nitro and with Raw. Like I'd, I'd try to watch both. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, this is great. And then, of course, Pro- jo- Professor John, you gave a little bit of your detail. But if you want to expand upon it, you have the floor, good sir. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I touched on that a little bit. My my experience is similar to John's too, in that I was watching a lot when I was a kid. I watched it a lot in the early 90s, leading up to the Attitude Era, lots of WCW stuff too. And this might 
a similar experience shared by many folks. By the time I got to like my senior year or getting into college, wasn't that it was like people would come up to you and go, you know, this fake rights, this and this. And you always knew that particularly being a theater person and be like, yeah, I did a lot of theater and that's what I teach. Stage now. So combatant. Like, Stage yeah, combatant. now, you know now it's I do. Fake. Right. It's like, I know that's not real. There just came up. There was just some of the sparkle that was taken out of it by the way that people treated me and the way I was pushed around and whatnot. I didn't have a community that all watched it with me. That was kind of went like, whatever. Then I was at that same time, I was also watching K1 fighting championships on ESPN and a lot of other MMA things and stuff like that. So I got really wound up into martial arts and other stuff like that too. Not that they butt heads, but in the early 2000s, that was definitely like, there was points of contention there. That's a whole other episode we could talk about. But yeah, I, women who are the bane of the earth, I started hanging out with girls and then stopped watching TV for years and doing theater and whatnot. And Came back to wrestling. Theater brought me back to wrestling. There's a handful of plays out there written about pro wrestling and a lot of wrestlers who started doing good movies, not old shitty movies, like actual decent films and things like that. So as an art, I have a lot more respect for it now that I've met wrestlers and seen wrestlers. And anecdote, probably for another episode, when I when my classes got cut a few months, about a month back, and I knew that I needed to find another job... I actually looked at a local indie wrestling company <laughs> to see what they paid and what they were doing. And I'm still kind of on the hook. That's not that's a hundred bucks to get thrown through a table at a casino. I don't hate that. Like I might sign up for that. As long as you carpools, you have to pay for gas, and then you're paying <laughs> hundred bucks every night. <laughs> it's true too. It is. It's forty five minutes away, so I might just Ooh, break, yeah, no. b- break even. So yeah, Good I fun. remember the the Undertaker and Shawn Michaels being the kings of the world. I remember the Attitude Era very vividly. I remember The Rock being terrible and then The Rock being cool and then The Rock being terrible again and then The Rock turning into the fucking rock. I remember that whole arc and how they tried to put over Ken Shamrock and it didn't work because Ken's a little crazy. Things like that. Just a little crazy. I can't tell Ken Shamrock stories because he'll find me. He'll hurt me. But I have those stories for off the air. But I'll ramble. (laughs) I'm rambling. I'm rambling. Are you a rabbit? Oh my God. No. No. Oh, Mikey, go. Don't worry, because we're going to we're going to we're going to talk about a lot of things, because actually, that's there's, actually going to so much anger in your voice. What happened? We're Not a talk lot. About a lot of things. We're going to talk about so much. And talk about this and you're going to hear yeah. us talk. Who knows? Yeah. I might get angry with a lot of stuff, but we'll see, because our oh. first the first thing we're going to discuss is that. Uh, so this episode is going to be interesting and it's going to be a kind of a. Uh, year in review special so to speak we're going to be reviewing a few things we're going to review some of the major key points that happened in the world of professional wrestling we're going to talk about our favorite and not so favorite pay-per-views of the year we're going to talk about what some of our favorite matches were what our who our top male and female superstar of the year is as well as our hopes and dreams and other things when it comes to the world of professional wrestling in 2023 so let's just jump into the juiciest bit of this whole entire thing, because we're going to save the arguments for later. <laughs> a lot happened this year in the world of professional wrestling. Nah. I'm like, just to highlight some of the some of the stuff. But uh, we're going to. Yeah, there was a lot of people that were released in WWE over the course of this past year. So that was crazy. And then a lot of them got rehired towards the midpoint of the year, which we'll get into a little bit. There's a lot of people leaving WWE. There was. Uh, yeah, l- let's just jump into it. So a lot of the f- first half of the year was very WWE related, just many people being released, lots of questionable decisions. But I think the craziest one that happened was during the summer, we I wake up one morning to find out that Vincent Kennedy McMahon retires as the CEO of WWE and is no longer in charge. And for me, that was the biggest story that had happened in the world of professional wrestling up to that point. Do you know about? Yeah, who's this guy? Why? Who's who's Kennedy McMahon? I've never heard of Kennedy McMahon. No, it wasn't Kennedy on the MTV? She was a VJ for a while. Now she's like a Republican. Yeah, she's on Fox News or something. Yeah, yeah. she is not back into the left. As you can tell, me and the co-host don't think too highly of Vince McMahon. And of course not. I've been spending 30 years hating Vince McMahon. It's hard to say from now. And someone who has entire personalities hating Vince McMahon. I know. Oh, my goodness. I was just going to say, when I woke up in the middle of June to find out that he retired after, I was like, this has got to be an angle. I was like, there's no way this is actually happening. And then once... 
all the news outlets started to report it. And then once the New York Times published the article, I was like, holy shit, this is actually really happening. I was like, what is going down? Because I want to say, and there's other wrestling nerds who know better, maybe you guys do too, that the Vince retiring angle or the Vince handing it over angle came up every few months for a while. I give well, from back like, now. It's happening again. That's just a trope of I'm going to hand this off to, or I'm just dis- like, there was always, that's always been underneath stuff since Vince, because Vince has bad writers and horrible ideas. It's also hugely carny of him. It's, it makes complete sense. He would do it. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like Vince has to be the head of the carnival. And what sucks is treating it like a carnival. It's just the whole thing as an art now would be the big meta take. But yeah, the early year, the early year, the WWE was best to watch. Yeah, I, the first the first half of the year was horrible. Say the first half of that many. I, I didn't. I missed the first half of what you said. Yeah, your mic didn't pick that up. Oh, that's dumb. Okay, I so said the first half of um, twenty twenty two was not the greatest for WWE for terms of normal weekly television. Yeah, when you couple that with <laughs> the many releases, want a list? I found a list. Okay, yeah, please, please, yes. me too. So here we go. So WWE releases twenty twenty two. Every WWE star fired. I'm going to try and rapid fire this. This is going to be crazy. Do it. Do Andy it, do Rose, it. December 14th. NXT that- wrestlers, November 1st. Bodie Sloan, Erica Yan, Damaris Griffin, Rufang, Nigel McGuinness, October 7th. Jimmy Smith, October 7th. Jeff Jarrett, August 21st. NXT UK. Looks like everybody's gone. Everybody, like everybody can catch these, names these there. papers. Oh my gosh. Those um, we'll go into that in a little bit. <laughs> Troy Donovan back in June, who NXT twice. So D- Dexter Loomis, Malcolm Bivens, Dakota Kai, Harlan, Ellen Devine, Draco Anthony, Vishkan, oh, all these names. Some of these names I know, even though I didn't watch a lot in the first half of the year. Kushida back in April, Nash Carter back in April, Cesario. Cesaro. Uh, oh, Cesaro. C- Dur- I know Cesario. <laughs> like, Cesar- Sorry, I'm trying to read C- fast. Cesario Dawson? <laughs> I was like, Cesario wait. Dawson. Somebody's re- that guy's wrestling now? Moa Joe, Gabe Sapolsky, going back to, yeah, William Regal. Who? Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Huh? We'll Who? talk uh, about that in a little bit. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then there's just a whole chunk of quote unquote coaches and managers. Road Dog, Jesse James, Timothy Thatcher, Danny Birch, oh, Hideki but he's Suzuki. Back. Some of these folks are back from my understanding too. Yeah. Cat Scott Armstrong, George Carroll, Christopher Guy. That's got to be... I don't know, at least 50 names. NXT one's huge. I'm not reading all those. There's like 30 names in this list. I was like, they're <laughs> all A lot gone. of those were not, weren't even ones that were like on TV either. They were let go because they did the six month like contract didn't go anywhere. And like, no, we're not spending any money on you because you're not getting on TV. But yeah, there was a lot of names that you read too. I was super baffled. Like my man, Samoa Joe got fired. Then he got rehired and then he got fired again. I want to say Samoa Joe's debut was ECW, right? Was Samoa Joe an ECW guy? He was Is he always a WC? ROH, Pro Wrestling Gorilla, and then he did Impact for a while with AJ Styles. He was on I mean, TNA, yeah, formerly known as TNA. Okay, get my plot <laughs> lines Jojo. Right. Moa Jojo. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that, yeah, the first half was, the first half underneath the rule of Vincent Kennedy McMahon was not the greatest. And then when he retired, and the reason why is because he used company funds as hush money for the multiple illicit do I want to say alleged? Yeah, we'll have to for the protection of this podcast. Allegedly having lots of affairs with multiple women and using company funds as the allegedly using company funds as hush money. And then what got him is they literally Al Capone him. He didn't report it using those funds. And so that's how he got booted out of power. Come on, bad like, guys, pay your taxes. Come on. <laughs> I still have my little conspiracy theory that I feel like I think Triple H and Stephanie had all this dirt and they did this on purpose. I would not. No one's going to admit to it, but that's my little conspiracy hat. I was just, oh, they had to. They had. I feel like they played a part in leaking, allegedly, the information. I wouldn't be surprised. Vince has so many enemies. It could have been any fucking buddy. Like, it was a matter of time before someone was finally like, here's the file on Vince. Somebody turn it over to the board. Somebody <laughs> check the numbers twice oh look there's a mistake please some like there someone one had to have done that but it was fucking it was vince russo (laughs) it was vince russo (laughs) 
<sighs> you, guys, you guys want to read my magazine? Yeah, Vin it was Jim Cornette. Just for Jim Cornette. <laughs> oh, Jim Cornette. I want to. I sorry, tangent. I really want to like Jim Cornette, but Jim Cornette is just such a tool sometimes. It, I'm like, don't ah. like Jim Cornette. Do never never like Jim. Cornette. No, no, but I'm. I want. Okay, this. But I want to. But then all of a sudden, I was like, ah, oh, you're a racist. Fuck. Why do you do that, Jim Cornette? You're a misogynist. Damn it, Jim Cornette. Why do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, when that happened, and then it wasn't even, and then the weeks later, it, they announced that Stephanie and Nick Khan were going to be co CEOs. I'm like, okay, cool. And then Triple H was in charge of creative. I'm like, say what now? Who? Triple Wait. H, Hunter. Oh, my bad. Paul Levesque. Paul Levesque. Oh, Paul Levesque. Oh, Paul Levesque. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the one that's really big with, I think, Motorhead likes him a lot. His Lemmy Motorhead stories are incredible, if you have not heard those, by the way. Especially because he's a teetotaler and he's hanging out with Lennon. Come exactly. on. It's a clean-shaven dude from Connecticut and his, he has freaking Lemmy Kill Mr. stories. Wait, what? He's from New Hampshire. He's actually from New Hampshire. Even more posh. Wow. I know. Wow. Wait, have you seen his first character? Shit. I remember. That's Paul Levesque. I am British, <laughs> fancy white guy. Jean-Paul oh. Levesque and William Regal. Oh, I play lacrosse. Get the fuck out. <laughs> there you were an ascot to the ring. Oh, and oh only my an ascot. gosh. I forgot <laughs> about that. Ah, that's what it's he was pronounced known for. Ashram. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was. It, it was better than stunning Steve Austin. No. <laughs> stunning Steve Austin was awesome. I, Paul Levesque was. It was a good character at this. It was not for Triple I mean, H, but. Paul Levesque came out about four or five years earlier. He would have been one of the Hollywood blondes, and that would have been a faction that could have changed <laughs> wrestling forever. That it would did. have been as a two man power trip. It, it oh. did. It changed <laughs> everything. Die oh. Shawn Michaels hair blonde. Throw him in there. Oh my god. Oh my oh, gosh. Dude. You had in Rick. You had in Ric Flair. There is oh. an alternate timeline where there's a whole lot of Hollywood asshole wrestlers, and it's gonna. It would be really good. <laughs> Put Flair in as the manager and make them all the new fabulous Freebirds, and you're all set. There it oh is. Oh my god. There it is. <laughs> There it is. That, that would have been worse than the NWO. I mean, everything was worse than the NWO. You're not right. Well, just out of pure power. All right, we're on a tangent, Fuck but I'm going to share this with you. There's a vintage <gasps> store here in town. I have this photo to back it up, but this podcast, so the medium doesn't translate. There is an original NWO t shirt for sale at this vintage store $150. Still pick it up. It was really hard not to, but I, and it's cool. It's one of the cool ones, and I'm like, oh man, it's like a 1997 one. What is this? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> you probably can make it at your house for ten. Probably, I could probably just yeah do the screen graph thing exactly. myself. <laughs> just yeah. Oh my goodness, but yeah, that that was probably the all that was the highlight of the summer in terms of the news because that was everything i was like what is happening and watching all the wrestling like youtube channels having to like they're in the middle of a party or something like no one expected this all of a sudden we have to do a drunk interview with ourselves about what the hell just fucking happened i've seen a few of those videos too i think it's i when you want i'm trying to be articulate and not sound like a total idiot this Vince McMahon handing down the reins thing, like we talked about every, however many months now I need to do it. I wonder how much of it is behind the scenes turmoil. I'm going to phase myself out or find myself a way out or do one last match or whatever. Cause John will remember this because he's as old as I am. There was a whole arc like this when the affair came out and Linda McMahon divorced him and the daughter and Stephanie was mixed up in it. That's 98, 99, 2000. Like that, they ran that for three months where it was like, this is an empire. Linda's going to take over. There's a settlement in the thing and the thing. Which Did he do the end with Vince in a match against his wife? Not his wife. No, she was sitting in a chair watching. And it was him and Steph. And uh, Steph had a lead pipe and was beating the crap out of him, but ended up losing because Vince beat the crap out of her, which led to WrestleMania 2000, where it was the Four Corners McMahon match. With there it is. That's what I was point. trying to think of. There it is. Good knowledge. That's, yeah, uh, that's, oh, I remember that match. Remember watching, so re-watch, re-watching it. So weird to watch just the head. This the oh. wrestling's notorious for this. Sorry, Mikey, this is not the podcast you wanted. New wrestling has got notorious <laughs> with that. Here's what's happening behind the scenes. Let's make a story arc out of it. For I mean, science, it's fantastic. And look what happened between Matt Hardy and Edge. I, you're not wrong. That was incredible, real life heat. But then it ended in something that Edge should not have won that feud, in my opinion. But they botched it wholeheartedly. But. Oh, it was fantastic TV for a while. 
For anyone who's an actor or who has done like actual trained, like given circumstances, borderline method stuff, you start to go crazy. Like it messes with you. I don't know. Humans are weird. Yeah, that whole saga was very interesting. And then once Triple H, Paul Levesque, Hunter, however you want to refer to him as. All Hunter Levick the third. Go ahead. Ryzen. Triple HPT. Or PL. <laughs> Triple HPL. Triple HPL. Triple HPL. Papa. Part of the APA. Papa Levesque, whatever you want to call him. Once he took over the reins, I was just like, I still have my issues. It is the end of the year. I think SmackDown has improved. Raw started off pretty good, but now it's just boring at the moment. I was just like, the TV is a lot better than it was six months ago. Oh, for sure. Look at the damage control Hunter had to come in there and do and be like, okay, no, the, that's they're on SmackDown right now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, it's damage curtail, but still it's, it's curtail. <laughs> curtail. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I need to get <laughs> I've had a hard time watching some of them because I can't get into them. I'm gonna be totally honest. The last few months, like I'll go to watch and be like, eh, but I'm trying, I'm really fighting through and trying, and I'm giving Hunter the benefit of the doubt. If I'm being honest, between all three brands, while I do a lot of the talent, if you're only going to pick one, I definitely recommend SmackDown. Though I do hope they shake things up over there because we're running into the same problem that we're having with Raw. But SmackDown, to me, is more fun and has more better storylines, in my opinion. We're about to get our once-a-year John Cena match. Bro, that... Oof. How could tell oh. that, though? There was nothing on that screen. It popped up. You can hear him talking. He said he was going to be there. I just don't know if we'll see him or not. You may not. I'm pretty sure you haven't because I've never seen him before in my life. Oh no, my I'm, I'm just going to wait for him to come out and go... <laughs> oh my god! Five, whatever the five moves of death or something. The, the fist five death. moves of doom. The five moves of doom, man. <laughs> Excuse oh me, goodness. sir. Are you colorblind? No, I just can't see John Cena. And then just <laughs> picked up and then thrown through an invisible wall. And then you're getting eight, then you're getting AA and five knuckle shuffled. <laughs> oh my god! I love how they changed the name from FU to AA, but they never changed the five knuckle shuffle. I don't know, man. But honestly. I'm actually, I'm pretty excited for that match. Honestly, if I'm being completely honest, the Bloodline storyline with Sami Zayn has probably been the best storyline to come out of this year for me, personally. Zane, MVP. Bro, how you feeling, pretty Usy? <laughs> yes! Bro! Oh, that was the funniest line I've ever when seen. Like, watching happened, everybody break character. That, for me, was the best, having been a performer in those things, like, when you have to hold in, that, in front of that many people and you can't. Because Bro. it's just brilliant enough, and the truth of it is even more brilliant. I was like, yes. Sami Zayn yes. is a national treasure. We must protect him at all costs. And Canadian. It... I love America. <laughs> all of that was just Canadian. Revoked. Canadian. <laughs> protect him at all costs because I love Sami Zayn. And it has been a joy watching the Usos and Roman and Solo trying not to break character every single I, week. I like the fact that Solo's bringing back Maga's moveset. Bro, that was that's with the so cement good. spike, and I'm gonna ram my ass into your face at full speed from Weissen on the floor. I will say, Solo's cannonball like that looks a lot more like Mick Foley than it is Rikishi, though. Mm. Or Umaga. That's I true. Do, I have to do my research. I, and I honestly, I like Solo's cannonballs, but the, there's one particular wrestler I think has the best cannonballs to me, and that's Brody King. But we'll talk about that later. That's because he's a giant howitzer of a cannon. Like it's the four, almost 400 pound man doing that. <laughs> We'll talk no. about that later. Oh, Mikey, go, Mikey, go. Wait, wait, I just want to throw this in there quick. Because you brought up Brody King, did you see the meme that came out recently where they're talking about like, doctors invented anesthesia in 1895, 1894? It's just Brody King choking some guy on the side of the <laughs> road. Bro, that, that image will forever live in my mind when he choked out Darby Allen. I was like, bro, <laughs> that was intense. But honestly, yeah. Side note, watching Brody Key's interview with Renee Packett and just like how Julia Hart came to be involved with the House of Black and him being oh, surprised gosh. how this sweet, dainty little girl is like, yeah, you know, what is this like? What do you want your theme to be? It's like, I like Nine Inch Nails and whatnot. And Brody King say, what? It's like this sweet cheerleading, like blonde girl. She's like, yeah, Nine Inch Nails, all that stuff. Brody King is a, I love him as a human being. He's great. He's, yeah, I like Brody King. But anyways, but yeah. Vince retiring was a highlight, and then everything died down. It's okay. Things have settled down. And then we get to September 2022. The what we what the wrestling community has is referring to as Brawl Out 2022, bro. So for a little bit of context, for those of you 
who forgot or weren't paying attention. So this takes place af- behind the scenes in the locker room after AEW's all out pay-per-view over Labor Day weekend 2022. So this past September at this point, just to give a little bit of context with the people involved, the elite, which is made up of wrestlers, Kenny Omega and the tag team and the Young Bucks were crowned the inaugural trios champions, defeating Hangman Page in the Dark Order. And then the other person that was involved in this is the returning CM Punk, who also returned to wrestling this year. My, what a year has it. My, my, what a year it has been for Punk. So he returned at the beginning of the year or towards the beginning. of Yeah, whatever. The point being is he beat John Moxley to become AEW champion. And then during the scrum, he just put CM Punk just puts people on blast during the media scrum. And then we come to find out later that the elite and the Bucks didn't take too kindly. And then a fight broke out backstage between these four wrestlers and producer eight steel a steel. And then there was a dog involved as well. It was hey, fuck, what, there, there's a dog involved in this. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I've heard everything you said up until now until there was a dog involved. Phil's dog oh. either got either bit somebody or got kicked. And then like a steel bit somebody because of it. And. There was chairs oh. being there were chairs being thrown. <laughs> yeah. He sick the dog on somebody? No. The dog was kicked by someone involved, supposedly. It was kicked by one of the people involved in the brawl. And then <laughs> because of that, Ace Steel decided that that set off Punk and then Punk went nuts. And, and for every you don't kick his dog, but it, there's so much he said she's he said in this respect for a lot of it that I don't even know. There's still stuff in the that doesn't make sense that all of it came out. It's very carney esque still. And they're all gonna kick a there. dog. Who kicked the dog? We don't know, but we do know that a steel bit Kenny Omega. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This was the most bonkers thing that I had heard. I was just like, and man, like as soon as this happened, I'm like, this has happened Sunday. And of course it's Labor Day on Monday. So I'm sitting there on Monday. I was like, I'm very interested to see what happens on Dynamite because of all this. And man, boy, oh boy, did things take a turn. Because then Wednesday Dynamite, came on days later we find out we have two different tournaments one to crown an, an interim aew champion and then we have a tournament to get new trios champions so we get through the next couple of weeks where john moxley ends up becoming aew champion poor man he was supposed to go on vacation and then he stuck around because of everything that happened and then death triangle yeah death triangle became the trios champions Yep. We'll talk about it later, but I'm getting tired of this best of seven series. I was like, why? Why are we doing this? Because like Seamus and Cesaro did it and it worked. But like the first couple matches were cool, but now it's just like we listen. We already know that they already showed their hand that Kenny and the Bucks are going to win the titles back and then they're going to enter a feud with House of Black. They already told they visually told us that on TV. I was like, what is happening? Here's the other part of it, though, from what I was hearing from a couple other places they literally condensed six months worth of storytelling because of people being out for both brawl out and injury to six weeks. They are trying to fit this in as quick as possible, get it over with, be done with it, which this was supposed to be the entire year. Get it done before the end of the year. So the house of black can wreck house, which I am all here for. Give me Malachi black in my veins every day. of the week. House of black is great, but I was just like, this is, I'm like, I feel bad for Death Triangle and this whole thing, man. Like, I really do. (laughs) They have a bastard on their team who likes to hit people with a mini hammer. Poor Pac, who is resorting to the ring bell hammer as a weapon of choice to be mini Triple H. I I only know bits and pieces of this plot line. There's a dog and a mini hammer? It's lowercase h. It's lowercase h. (laughs) But yeah, Brawl Out was intense. Like, it was the talk of the town. And then when you couple that with injuries and then with all the storytelling got thrown in out of whack, John Moxley decided he couldn't afford to take a vacation. So he had to step in and he stayed. But I was just like, this man was supposed to go on vacation. Like that was crazy. But another crazy one for me that happened this year 
<laughs> was Cody Rhodes leaving his baby AEW to go back to WWE? That shit was in. I was what, what I was like. What is happening, you guys? I, I was very because I had just I didn't I was not as familiar with the brawl as I should have been, but I had Cody just started. Rhodes like is the son of Dusty Rhodes, just so you're yes. clear, and he's the brother of Dustin. Ro okay, I'm just making sure you're up to speed. Love them. Okay. No, I know I know the Ro I know the Rhodes family. I'm I'm a Rhodes scholar. I'm a Rhodes scholar. I'm so smart. I that time came was a lot better than people give it credit for. That's true. <laughs> I had just started watching. I was like six weeks into watching it consistently. And then Cody was like, I'm going to leave. Fuck it, I just got here. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't the worst idea. The money was, the timing was right. The money was good. Hey, and WWE let him keep the American Nightmare theme song, all that other stuff. That was bananas to me. I was like hearing it at WrestleMania when he fought Seth Rollins. I was just like, bruh. Harris is pectoral, then gets in a match at Hell in a Cell with a torn peck. That was hey, bananas. We gotta talk about that later because that might be a pick of somebody's. <laughs> are you foreshadowing here or are you just, just saying that because? It's not foreshadowing. It's a premonition. Ooh. <laughs> but yeah. Th thanks, Paul Heyman. Honestly, the, <laughs> honestly, those two things were the big things for me, but some smaller things like that was like, <laughs> what is happening here? You talk about my favorite what the fuck. <laughs> Fly. Yeah, go for it. From that, you knew 2022 was going to be terrible for at least the first 10 months of 2022. Shane McMahon, number four, <laughs> Royal Rumble. Uh, we'll get into ooh, we'll get into that more detail because I have feelings on that. Ooh. We're talking about that later. Or we're talking about that now. Yeah, that's going to be part of the best and worst pay per views. Oh, I'm going to let you take a damn. guess on that. Oh, Let's talk about oh that later. God, yeah. I don't want to ruin yeah. anyone else's premonition. But yeah, that so happen. that was crazy. Some other things that had happened. This... Stepping, stepping down and then having to come back to be CEO. Like literally stepping I know. away to dodge the scandals that were coming that she saw coming from Vince. To and then she him. had to come back. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie was like, you know what? I'm going to take some time. I'm going to spend time with my husband and my children. And, and then this died. Nearly just died at that time too. Let, must I, let us not forget. But some, something that... It, yeah, an awful. It's just we're just learning the last few weeks how close Triple H was to. Oh, I was dying. He was dead on the table. Yeah, he was yeah. really dead on the table. That I, I and they, they glossed over it a little bit, and you knew something was not right. And it, when reality blurs there for a little bit, but then I didn't hear that until I don't know. He did an interview, and they talked about it, and then yeah, dead on the table thing came out not too long ago too. Yeah. Wait, what? Sarah, it's a fuck your body up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I was like, I'm thankful that Triple H did not die because, like, we don't wish that upon anybody. And I just like, I just want you to take care of yourself. But yeah, some other things for me, too, that have been very interesting this year at the beginning of the year, because he's been missing for the majority of this year due to it. Biggie breaking his neck was very scary to watch. Like, I already expressed my feelings when it initially happened. And I was just like, this man... I was like, yeah, I, it was horrifying to watch it happen. I was like, oh, no. I was like, not Big E, not Big E. It was a uh, freak accident, too. It wasn't anything like that they really could control at that point. He just came down wrong. Yeah, it was bad. And I felt really bad because, like, for a while, I know that Rich Holland was getting so much hate for it. And the in wrestling fans are toxic anyways. But Internet wrestling fans were horrible. Like, sure. at this point, they were coming after him for a, for a few months, actually. Yeah. And like it died down by March, but even still Ridge, poor Ridge, man, like it was a freak accident. It wasn't his fault. Everybody was coming after him, blaming him and just getting updates from Biggie. I was like, we don't know if he can return to wrestling ever at this point. So I'm like, oh, he's very lucky. Is he had the neck he did to save his life. Basically, mm. If you've learned anything in the last 30 seconds, <laughs> don't do steroids and work your traps. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I've yeah. Heard about, I heard about the Biggie thing with, I heard about the Biggie because I was watching G4 while G4 was still going Jesus, over the summer. Yeah. And uh, Austin Creed had said something, had tweeted something about it, about, hey, my older brother, this. And I was like, wait, what? Because I just watched the video. Where they're just talking dirty things and laughing, not too long. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like, as for Big E, I just heard this. I'm heading to the emergency room. I was like, wait, what? Because I was loosely watching wrestling at the time. That shit's horrifying. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, that whole thing was crazy. And then I don't know if anyone really wants to talk about it. This might get us in trouble. But like we also had some returns this year in the world of wrestling that I wasn't expecting. Like the more recent ones, former WE Page, a.k.a. Sir 
Soraya, Soraya, how, however you want to call it. She returned to in-ring action after five years. However you feel about her relationship with her boyfriend, fiance, whatever you want to call that thing aside, I'm happy to see her get back in the ring because I remember how excited I was when Daniel Bryan came back and Edge came back from a neck injury. And then when Roman Reigns came back from his leukemia diagnosis, like I was happy to see it. You could still tell she was rusty, but I'm happy to see her finally back in the ring, which is what she really wanted to do for so long. Stem cells would do a lot of good things, you guys. Just FYI. And apparently D- and DD Yoga also saves lives. Yeah, that saves a lot of lives. Yeah. Like we joke, but like DP Yoga has saved so many legends lives. This saved them from like, by. yeah, saved them from like addiction and like and Jake the Snake. Oh, uh, who is it? Someone. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Someone credited DP Yoga with walking again. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, he was a paratrooper. His I'm not back, crazy. He, he, his back got all fucked up from the, all the landings and he just got really big because he wasn't moving. I, Did DP Yoga drop like 150 pounds and now he's walking? Doing like handstands and shit. Yeah, handstands, headstands, all that stuff. This is a tangent, and this might be another episode, Mikey, where we talk about wrestlers and their other careers or business ventures. Oh my gosh. DDP's <laughs> career, like each chapter, seems like every 20 years he's a different person. <laughs> yeah. He like just does done crazy, didn't start wrestling until he was 35, like learning how to do it. Like this incredible shit. Oh my goodness. But yeah. For me, those were some of the highlights of 2022 in wrestling. And the lowlights at the same time. And the lowlights, yeah. Let's just keep the highlights and the lowlights going. So let's talk about the best and the worst pay-per-views of this year, because everybody had some different picks. We might some overlap. I only watched two and a half, so we'll talk about them. So for a disclaimer, of the four of us on this podcast, I probably have a tougher time in the sense that I've watched way too many pay-per-views across three different brands of wrestling. I guess four if you want to count NXT as its separate brand, but technically it's still under the umbrella of WWE. But the point being, I watched a lot of pay-per-views this year. There's still pay-per-views, even though they're on Peacock? And like available <laughs> next day on demand? If you like, watch AEW, yeah. AEW and Ring of Honors and the big four Impact pay-per-views are also still like actual pay-per-views yeah. you have to yeah, pay yeah. for. I still watch the hour-long Ring of Honor specials when they come on and things like that. <laughs> Still, we'll in, talk, they're in syndication now, even though they're not around. We'll talk about Ring of Honor because that's part of my hopes for 2023. Bro. All right. Yeah. So where do we want to start with the best or do we want to start with the worst? First, we talked too many good things. Let's talk about horrible things. All also, right. Like, going to make us talk more about the worst of the best ones anyway. So that is true. All right. So let's start with the worst. Who wants to go first? I, mean, I blow it saying this a little bit earlier, but my I carved out time in my dumb schedule to figure Mm. out an afternoon to sit with a buddy of mine that I've known for 20 plus years to watch the Royal Rumble back in January. And he was like, you haven't seen a pay-per-view in a long time. I know you're doing wrestling stuff. I know you're playing this slightly erotic Viking Santa and this other thing. You should come watch. We're going to hang out. We're doing this thing. Yeah, sure. So I hung out there for hours watching this. He's a tough dude. And he was surly from the moment it started. And I, was, I wasn't asking questions necessarily, but I was definitely like, yeah, this doesn't feel right, does it? Oh, look, Brock's here. And you hear him like, oh, God damn it. The worst part Just, is he wasn't wrong on the fact like that pay-per-view is like usually 100%, even if it's bad, you watch it and it's fun. And that's what I remembered from growing up. being like, the Royal Rumble is the fun one. It kicks off the year. It feels good. There's all kinds of crazy shit. Yeah, it was not. you can't mess it up. You can't get this wrong. Yes, you can. If and Shane McMahon was, books it. Shane McMahon thing is where I spilled my drink. I was definitely, I was okay. I was buying into, all right, fine. I'm just watching a living comic book, whatever. And then Shane at number four, even I was like, this, what? Okay, so let's just go over the entire card because just really quickly, we'll focus on the Rumble matches because that's my biggest problem. And if it's not clear, Royal Rumble 2022 is also my worst pay-per-view of the year. Hey, we're all on the same. Me too. Okay, so we're all on the same page. We we clean sweep the fucking thing. Let's go. Royal Rumble 2022. All four of us have picked as the worst pay-per-view. But let's go into the reasons why it was my worst one as well as I want to hear from all of you. So. We opened the pay-per-view with Seth versus Roman, which ends in a DQ. I was like, why? I was like, why? 
I was like, they booked themselves in a corner at this point. You don't want Roman to lose, but Seth is still on a hot streak. Well, and he's every time Seth is in a good match, he has to be booked for a DQ, even in a Hell in a Cell match. So this we don't talk sense. about the Hell in the Cell match. <laughs> it led to this. That is true. We don't talk. That still by far is the worst match of the modern era for me. Bray Wyatt versus Seth in that Hell in a Cell. That was god awful. We don't speak of that match. <laughs> we. Seth Rollins wishes and like doesn't speak of it either. But man, but yeah, that I was so upset. I was like, why is this a DQ? I was like, they book again. They at this point of WWE booking, they booked themselves in a corner. You can't have Roman lose, but you don't make Seth lose either. And so what do they do? They go back to the regular playbook of let's have a DQ finish. You have John Moxley to stick in there to be a third wheel and break everything up. Oh my goodness. I was it already had started off bad. And then we get to the next match, which was the women's rumble. OK, between the two, I enjoyed the women's one a little bit better. But let's talk about the precursor to this. You had multiple releases a couple months prior, like towards the tail end of 2021 leading into the rumble. And then Vincent Kennedy McMahon was like, oh, dang, we don't have enough women. Oh. So let me, <laughs> and this is what I hated leading into both Rumbles. I hate when they, like they have to, cause they want to get eyes to watch this stupid thing. But I was like, I don't like it when they tell us like, who's going to be in the Rumble. I was just like, why are you spoiling all the surprises? So, okay. okay. Granted, they didn't spoil that Rondo was returning. I was like, whatever. Okay, cool. Sure. I, I was pissed. Like <laughs> I, I was a casual fan. I hadn't watched it in a while. Hey. Oh, I got to be careful how I say this. I almost said something that would have gotten me in trouble. I will say that I do not like Ronda Rousey. No. I'm so that was where I and I the friend of mine I was watching with was also rather upset too. Like, why are you here? You don't want to be here. What are you doing? Anyway, sorry, Mike. Making ahead. money. <laughs> I don't fault anyone for making money. It's also like you if you're just going to hold other people. I don't know. He's fucking you're not Brock Lesnar, even though you're booked like Brock Lesnar. You're not Brock Lesnar. And even with Brock Lesnar, you don't want Brock Lesnar there. Like he did your one thing the year before where Brock ran through half the field, which was actually freaking funny. You've done that now. You can't do it again. It's Ugh. even when Brock did it, it felt half assed. <laughs> it felt half assed, but it just felt contrived. And then that was my opinion. Not watching like Chris Benoit do it and get down to Ugh. the final two. But yeah. Honestly, the women's to me was a little bit more fun, but I was just like, there was just a lot going on because of all the releases and how thin the women's roster was and spoiling the, all the people were there. Well, the best saying, part. Was, go ahead. I just want, was wondering, was that the one where Mickey James came back? They actually allowed her. to. Yes. Off the OK, that was let's the only, talk about like, good thing for that entire pay-per-view. Let's talk about that, because there were two great moments in that match for me personally. That one was that part was freaking interesting. The fact that. What was it? Not even a couple months ago, that whole trash bag incident when Mickey James got let go by WWE and they threw all her stuff in a trash bag and Mickey put WWE on blast for that. And then at this point, she was an impact and she had just won the impact knockouts title, which is their women's title. And the fact that she appeared at the Rumble with her hardcore country <laughs> song from impact and the fact that they on the little graphic, it introduced Mickey James impact knockouts champion was bonkers to me i was like she, wow they're actually the admitting belt. there are other promotions yeah, she had the belt and she came in with the knockouts title i was like whoa that was crazy to me the other great part for me personally was that little bit when ivory came out because i thought that was fucking hilarious and it was, it was <laughs> right to censor ivory which is the best yeah oh, to censor gosh, ivory that's that's that was like the best part then we get down to the final three. I figured Bianca wasn't going to win because she had won the year before. I was like, okay, that's fine. And you, honestly, at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm okay if Charlotte wins. I have my personal issues. Yeah. But yeah, no, Ronda won. I was like, okay, whatever. But here's what I'll say on my part of this. I'm, I was happier at the time that Ronda won over Charlotte. I did not want Charlotte to win another one. She didn't need it. She needed to prove that she could actually be in a storyline that didn't involve her chasing the title because she has no worth otherwise other than basically being her father. And that continues to this point where I've been happy she hasn't been on TV all year. Not because she's a bad wrestler, not because the character doesn't really work. It's just that whenever they book her, there's no substance. She can't hold any attention other than if she's after or holding a title. And that speaks so big about the fact that she doesn't know what to do. 
Oh, my goodness. But yeah, I was like, whatever. And then there were so many missed opportunities, too, like because just of the craziness of it, like. You had Cameron come back and then Naomi comes in afterwards. I was like, you couldn't have let them be in the ring a little bit longer than that. Like, where's uh, our Funkadactyl reunion? Come on. Been there, Brodus Clay. I was just like, get the girls there, back. Clay and, and then there was also another missed opportunity, too, because Sarah Logan came back for the Rumble and they didn't let her. There was no time for her and Liv to have some sort of interaction. There was, the women's match was like Miss Opportunity is the key word that came from it because there was some good stuff that they could have did. WWE didn't do that. They dropped the ball. Also, just really quickly, I'm, I might piss off a lot of the current WWE fans, but we don't need the Bella Twins to come back. I'm just saying that's just me personally. Like nothing against them personally, but I never found them entertaining in WWE. Like, I don't know, man. I don't want to hear another Brimo. Uh, I'm going to rip long, my fucking ears off. How long had they? How long had they been out? By the time they put them back in, not long enough. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Really? <laughs> I'm trying to. Right. been out for a while. Yeah, that's what I was, what I was trying to remember. I think Nikki had been like fully retired for about a year because of her neck. Okay, I believe because she was but, the last yeah. season was the last Rumble, and that was about it. And I'm just like, yeah. It was the women's one was Miss Opportunity, but that Ronda was like, whatever, but it didn't piss me off. And then the rest of the card was OK. Like we knew Dewdrop wasn't beating, beating Becky for the women's title like that. And I hate it because I'm like Dewdrop, which I still hate the name. I'm st- Why is I, du- that's what I was going to say. Why is Dewdrop's name Dewdrop? <laughs> because of copyrights, because WWE Man. can't monetize off of Piper Niven. I was like. <sighs> whatever or, Vip- or viper or viper i was I was sitting there with my buddy and i was like that's her name it was like that's piper and I was like, oh yeah dude hey, drop is so stupid what the fuck like who but it's spelled like d-o-u drop like when, when she came to regular u-s-a-w-e i was i got happy and then i should have remembered that i should have not been happy because of how at that time she was being booked because she ended up being like pretty much valet for Eva Marie of all people. <laughs> she still do drop. I'm looking this up now. She still do drop. She hasn't been on TV in quite some time. That's a shame. Which she's, I'm hoping she comes back. Great. Pretty yeah. Great. Her. What was it? The last match that I saw her before she came over to the United States was her versus Kaylee Ray for the NXT women's title in that fall count anywhere match where they fought in the ring. They went backstage. Piper Niven dropped off of like barricades and they were killing each other. That was well, such a good let's, match. Let's listen to this. Right then it was Piper Niven versus Kaylee Ray. Now it's Dewdrop versus Alba Fire. <laughs> yeah, that part <laughs> is fuck, just whatever. What the fuck? He hasn't wrestled in five months. Yeah. yeah. Literally since I think her and Nikki Ash broke up. He's yeah, in the DLC that's... for WWE 2K222. All right, that's something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, they got to pay her a little bit. She's still on contract. Yeah, but that's a I'm hoping I'm hoping she comes back to TV soon. But yeah, so we knew Becky wasn't losing that title. She'll be in the Rumble. I think she'll be in the Rumble. Yeah, I hope so. Do we have, do we have to watch the Rumble? Do I'm we have to? I want to, actually. With, right. with the returns that have just happened in the women's division, and especially one of sure. my favorites who just came back recently in the last two weeks, I'm watching the women's Rumble. I'm going to be very happy about the women's Rumble. The no, I mean, as, as a whole, I didn't mean just the women's. Are we? We can talk about that another time. What we're <laughs> yeah, we'll figure something out. But yeah, so I'm gonna have to because I'm going to the pay per view after it, so I want to see where it goes. That's right. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, you're going to Elimination Chamber, so that's gonna be fun. But yeah, so after that, I figured Bobby wasn't gonna lose the title to Brock either. It was. It was what it was. I will say I was highly entertained by Edge and Beth versus Miz and Maurice. That was actually a really entertaining match. Yeah. The entrance is worth it just for those two coming in. Oh, uh, it was so good. And the right people won, in my opinion. My, I was like, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was just like, you know what? People give Maurice a lot of shit, but I was like, you know what? She doesn't make me that mad. I was like, she's not the best wrestler, but you know what? She served her purpose and she was great. <laughs> the significant other of my dear friend who I was watching the Rumble with, the reality show. Of the yep. And she's a huge fan of it and adores them. And watch that whole match with us, and then was like, "That was great," and then leaves the room <laughs> like she was done. Was but that, that's what the match served much, its purpose for. <laughs> I was honestly surprised how much Maurice did. Yeah, me really too. That's what I was hearing. That was my reintroduction after wrestling for a while. Oh wow, they're doing great. 
It was awesome. But then we're just going to briefly talk about it. The men's rumble. That was the most boring rumble for the men ever. I was so bored. And also a lot of missed opportunities there. There were definitely pairings they could have worked with and done stuff with. And Kofi had his own botch that he couldn't come back from. And it was like, it was just bad. I think Johnny Knoxville was eliminated way too soon. I love Johnny Knoxville. Yeah, this whole stick there Johnny for those couple of bucks was awesome. <laughs> I love Johnny Knoxville. There was a lot of missed opportunities for pairings for like history, but I was also baffled. I was like, there are no men NXT. I was like, granted, there's very few men in NXT you could have put. I was like, you could have put in. I don't know. Even if you got to just have a showcase, I was like, Carmelo Hayes, like Cameron Grimes. I was like, they didn't want to deal with the puns of men NXT. Or is that just your fantasy, Mikey? I can't tell. We'll talk. (laughs) Fuck you. (laughs) Isn't that the website, menxt.com? Menxt. Oh my God, I hate you. I, I recommend using .go and not putting that into the Google. Yeah, but like we talked about, Shane McMahon. Put on your NordVPN. Why? Yeah. Shane McMahon coming out was like, the I was so upset. I was just like, yo, why is Bad Bunny the actually only entertaining thing so far in this match? What the fuck? And then Shane goes wild to beat up people that he has, can't touch in years. And then it comes out afterwards that he's the one to book the thing and try to switch with Randy Orton on the actual night to be able to be the one of the last two. Like, Changing it like within an hour of start. Wasn't that the whole story? Like it was- right before he went on with Randy. That's why the music right. was all screwed up. Right. It, I was like, what is happening? But then probably the moment that really made me mad is that number 30 Brock Lesnar comes out and then he fucking wins the Rumble. I was like, why are we doing this? Because uh, Lesnar versus Reigns sells money. Tickets. It sells money? It sells it's, money. It sells That's money. how tired of it we've been seeing. It sells money. Oh, did you hear, and you guys might know more than me, and I heard this rumor a few times, and I'm paraphrasing, that the original slotted winner was going to be Matt Riddle. I, I would have been okay with that, honestly. Oh, I'm trying to find my sources now that we're talking about it, which is bad podcasting. I'm trying to pull it up now. I heard one was a, someone who exposed something on Reddit that like was like a, a photo of a rough draft of a thing that they were like, this could be the Matt Riddle push that we want in this and this. And somehow Matt Riddle went from being first to like coming out 20th, like something ridiculous. He got, he got in trouble for some drugs. You do stupid he, shit? Is that what happened? It was stupid shit. He was getting divorced at the same time because of doing stupid shit with other people. And then the drug thing hit at the same time. And then he also pissed off somebody else back. I think he was like going after Goldberger again backstage when he saw him. <laughs> I would love to see Matt Riddle armbar the fuck out of Goldberg. <laughs> Goldberg won't fight him. Like, yeah, Goldberg has stated. None of them should fight Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle actually hurt you. <laughs> Matt yeah, Riddle's just SpongeBob attire at Clash of the Castle is so great. <laughs> I'll try and do some digging and find the actual source of that, but I'd heard that, and now there's a big there's a big conspiracy about it was Matt Riddle for this, and they were gonna push this that, and then it just got taken. yeah, he himself in the foot. Yeah, it, but that whole rumble was boring. I was irritated with the finish, and then it led to WrestleMania, which I knew where the end result was gonna be. I was just like, whatever. But that is the worst pay per view. Well, let's I, yeah I, I agree with professor on this one like it's so sad that's the worst one because this is usually a gimme the rumble yes. match is made to make it easy to get back in and have fun quick hits you don't have to be caught up in a lot of storylines this is starting the main one for wrestlemania like it should be a slam dunk how do you screw that up and then what baffled me too like i get it like a lot of the legends for the men were old but i was just like there was no like spots. There was no legends. I was like, "What is happening?" Bad Bunny. And so it was more celebrities, which they're going to be doing more and more. Of now Bad now. Bunny is entertaining as fuck every time he steps into the ring. I yes. still, th- I still, I still think him and Damien versus Miz and Johnny Drip Drip, as he was going by back then, John Morrison. That match was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm pulling up the list right now. Who are the legends that were there? There were like, many. See... Not for the men, at least, but for the women's, like, there is a, at least there were a couple. They're the ones, like, Melina returned after some time, and then that botched elimination was horrible. That was terrible. Kelly returned, but not, I, back. I don't know. Yeah. We had Michelle McCool, which is. Well, yeah. Lady Undertaker has to eliminate 18,000 people, because she's. Not she eliminated Mickey James. I was so <laughs> mad. I was like, 
Sonya Deville at that time was a free agent, and then Cameron came back, and then we had Ivory, Brie Bella, Mickey James, Alicia Fox, Summer Rae, Sarah that Logan. Was the she had, that was, Alicia Fox was let back in a building because she was still having like problems with being drunk all the time. Yeah, Summer Rae, Nikki Bella, Sarah Logan, Lita, Mighty my, Mighty Molly made a return. <laughs> Didn't that set up the Becky Lynch? Yep, and, that set up and, Becky versus Lita, which honestly, that was a fun match when it led to that. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible. I was like, Lita did have one botch, but you know what? I was so happy to see her back in the ring after. It wouldn't be a Lita match if there wasn't a botch. Lita was like the queen of botches and making it work and being awesome. Lita is amazing. But yeah, that is the worst pay-per-view of 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, we all picked the same one. It wasn't. It was mid at best. (laughs) Can I also say, I hope this year and this year's Rumble, if they do a legend spots, if we want a really old person since he's gotten back in shape and having his last match. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat in the, in the yes, bro. When I saw him and FTR had a match not too long ago, like teaming up, I was like, bro, this is amazing. Ricky, how old's Ricky now? Ricky's gotta be. Hang on, I'm going to the Google. 70s, a lot. To that was the joke I was gonna make. Isn't he seventy? <laughs> but he might actually be. Oh, he's close. He's sixty-nine. Nice. Yeah, he's right there. But yeah, I'm excited. Oh it's great. Now that we shit, now that we took a shit on the Royal Rumble, let's talk about our favorite pay per views of the year. Now, I don't know if y'all want me to go first because I watched more pay per views than anybody should realistically should. You're the host. You get to make the call. All right. Because since there's four of us, I want everybody to have their time. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep mine briefly. So I'll go through my second and my third pick as my top three. But my surprisingly enough, my favorite pay-per-view this year was actually SummerSlam 2022. I'm and that might be this year, because if you said SummerSlam 2021 this year, that'd be hysterical. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I have to because but SummerSlam 2022, which was this year's SummerSlam, honestly, was my favorite pay-per-view of the year. It might be because of I was watching it with some really good friends of mine and we had a good time. But honestly, the matches for that card was actually a real good time. Bianca versus Becky opening up match of the night for me. That was fire. And then the return, we had Bailey return. And then we had the call up of EO. And then we had the return of Dakota Kai at the end of the match. And then Becky got hurt and she still wrestled with the separated shoulder. For like the rest of the match, so that was Anyone bananas. It was Beth Rollins gets a separated shoulder at all times. Finn Balor. Uh, so there was that one. Logan Paul. I hate to admit it, impressed the hell out of me in his match. It was yeah, the same. I was, I was to so remember upset. If that was the the Logan Paul one. That was the Logan Paul one. I was upset how much I actually enjoyed that match. I'm upset at myself. Really? Is it worth watching? Really? It is for the spectacle of it but you're going to hate yourself for doing that. Man, yeah. I don't know if I want to hate. I hate myself a lot right now. I don't know if I need to put anything, <laughs> oh, no. I don't know if I need to put no, anything no, else on that hate seesaw. You for you. If you want to pass that along, we'll all hate you for Can you. I hand my hatred of myself off to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Make yourself oh. feel better and let somebody else deal with it. But yeah, sure. so I hate myself for it. I was shocked that Bobby, because at this point, because they were pushing Austin Theory, and I was shocked that Bobby beat Theory to retain the title I was like what is happening but i was pleasantly surprised i felt and this was just me in hindsight everything was fine but the mysterios versus judgment day was okay i didn't think dominic and ray needed to win that but that was um, that's just me the pre subinic days uh we'll talk about we'll talk about that later because rhea ripley mm. oh, mommy, oh, mommy. <laughs> mommy. <laughs> Listen, it was great. I still love that he keeps keeps getting called Subinic now. It's just (laughs) bro. This past Monday had me dying of laughter. Mommy, it burns. And Damian Priest is it's like I can't see it. Then Damian Priest is like, it could have been worse. It could have burned somewhere else. Porno stash. (laughs) When did he grow the porno stash? (laughs) What the fuck are you guys talking about? Listen, Judgment Day has become probably the funnest thing. (laughs) It's so good. So Dominic Mysterio has left his father, joined Judgment Day. Because of Rhea Ripley. Because Rhea is mommy now. Because oh, Rhea is mommy. And that's what the meme is. And yes. Dominic oh. is busting out his Eddie Guerrero calling himself Poppy. But now everyone's making fun of him because they were saying instead of Dom or Dominic, it's Sub or Subinic. <laughs> I mean, she is dressing all in leather I and jeans. I don't right. blame him, though. It's Rhea <laughs> Ripley. But what is Buddy Matthews thinking about this? Buddy Matthews is having a cackle. <laughs> Because honestly, Rhea Ripley is basically doing House of Black for him on this side, and hopefully she can jump ship over there. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. But yeah. Let's see what else happened. Pat McAfee defeated Happy Corbin. Eh. That he's I'm always surprised about that Pat's that good too, but also not because he's actually an athlete. It's amazing. Yeah. I actually I'm one of the few people I actually really enjoyed that match he had with Adam Cole in NXT. I actually enjoyed it. Pat McAfee is funny yeah. as fuck. Yeah. Listen to some of like his podcast. Like it, one of the best interviews. I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent. One of the best interviews I've ever seen was on the Pat McAfee podcast with Brock Lesnar. Not the one with Vince McMahon, where Vince McMahon basically admitted that he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I, we all do that. We all do. Vince had no idea what the fuck he was doing. It's Vince McMahon. I mean, we all. It's, it's weird seeing Brock in this kind of light. It was different to see Brock as he was a human. Smiling. He was smiling. He was cracking jokes. Big, scary, blonde, bull, bulwark man actually has a sense of humor sometimes. It was, yeah. Pat, I, like, I'm never surprised of how I know Pat McAfee puts in the work. So that match was pretty fun. The Usos and the Street Profits for the tag titles. I'm going to be honest. I was a little disappointed because but then you couldn't top anything because they had. This is technically a rematch from their previous match. Not a month ago at Money in the Bank. And that match was my match of the night at that pay-per-view. The tag team match at Money in the Bank was fire. And then this one was delivered a little bit. And then I thought we were going to see them break up. But, you know, now that we fast forward, they're still together as a tag team. I was like, oh, OK. I should rewatch this SummerSlam, even though it has Logan Paul in it. You can skip that match if you really want to. The highlights are out there. You can see what him like, do the giant stuff he did. But yeah, yeah. I, then... mean, I like the Miz, though. I might watch it to watch the Miz, though. Is it, uh, I'll defer to y'all if I dig it up. I might dig it up. You want to then we got a really short match. Be- yeah. And then we got a short match between Liv and Ronda, which had the weirdest, like, that mm, was the tap out pin, right? Yeah, that was the tap out pin. I was like, controversy. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> it was only four minutes. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it was only four minutes, we couldn't find out later because Miz and Logan's match went on for too long. <laughs> yeah, they went over way over. <laughs> Your match gets they cut also, short because of Logan Paul. That's hilarious. And they hilarious. booked Liv into oblivion because they can't let her actually like win, which they needed to at that point to cement her, which was the worst part. Yeah. And then we got the crazy spectacle that was the last man standing match with the whole tractor moment of Brock. I before. loved that. I loved <laughs> that. That part was great. Win. This is real like, then. I saw one or two YouTube clips of this. I saw some memes of it when it happened. Mother drove a tractor down into the thing and then they fought on the broken ring with a tractor. Yes. yes. Brock yep. Lesnar really lifted it up and Roman Reigns took it like a champ. John, you as a, as, as a combatant will completely be in awe of Roman Reigns taking that fall and rolling out of the ring as it was up that way because he took it perfectly and went did not hit the ring post. Gotta watch it. I gotta watch it. I didn't know it was a SummerSlam. I knew it happened at some point of the last six months or so, but he as a cowboy re- Brock also had the thing where Brock threw the mic and Roman just fucking caught the fucker. That's cool <laughs> that, as hell. I've that seen was that. He just rinks at him. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And then Paul Heyman got used as a weapon too, yeah. <laughs> which was awesome. I'm still so sad they haven't done a Paul Heyman on a pole match for the two of them yet. They should. That's the only time. I'm, that's, I'm surprised that okay. match hasn't happened yet in general. I know, right? It's because the last time we had an on a pole match, we don't talk about it. Bailey versus Alexa with the kendo stick on a pole match was garbage. I feel like Paul Heyman's 100 years old. He's only 57. His man's is crazy. But yeah, that was my best. That was my best pay-per-view this year. Really quickly. Second place was Forbidden Door for me. And then my third place was actually Slam Impact Slammiversary 2022. Nice. So those are... Yeah, but SummerSlam is my favorite pay-per-view, so I will give the reins to whoever wants to go next. Uh, my, my, my was, was your second pick. AEW, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Forbidden Door was my pay-per-view of the year. Nice. Because since I didn't get... Uh, if you ever watch Friday Night Fights, I'm a big uh, Kenny Omega fanboy, but the next best thing to Kenny Omega is Will Ospreay, and seeing him in Orange Cassidy in the match was fucking phenomenal. Oh my god. Those two okay. worked incredibly well in that. Entire pay per view was fucking dope. I wish New Japan had a couple more wins. Those just so that they're not just a bunch of chumps over there on the east side because those guys are fucking insane. New Japan Pro Wrestling is just crazy. But I feel like they're going to get their theirs back at Wrestle Kingdom because there's going to be a bunch of AW guys in the G1 and they're going to get their asses handed to them. That's yeah, the hope. That's the hope. And I will say because a lot of people were doubting of how good this pay per view was going to be because going into it of like people getting sick and then a lot of people got injured before and no, no build, build to it. <laughs> 
And then you always run the risk because it was like, if nobody knows New Japan Wrestling. So this was an interesting experience because I watched it by myself first and I knew who everyone was. I don't religiously watch New Japan, but I know who the key players and factions are. So you secularly watch it? Not religiously, just secularly? Yes, exactly. Only Only on the holidays? Only on the holidays. Oh my gosh. But it was such an interesting experience watching Forbidden Door a second time with my friend who has never watched any or heard of any New Japan people. And just seeing the authentic reaction of how much he enjoyed it, I was like, yeah, New Japan's great. But yeah, I really enjoyed that pay-per-view. And they pulled off a hell of a couple matches, which we'll get into in a little bit. Some of those matches made my favorites list. (laughs) Jay White, Hangman Adam Page, Okada, and Adam Cole. Oh my god. (sighs) Yeah. Oh my God. And then the main event of Tanahashi versus John Moxley. Whew. So this is me cheating because I only saw two and a half pay-per-views. <laughs> That's fine. So that was the one half pay-per-view and I only saw half of it. And that was my pick for best pay-per-view. <laughs> nice. Honestly, like we can't disagree. <laughs> I, saw, I saw the highlights. I don't know. I can't remember any of the names. Nothing. When I was watching, I was like, this Horseshoe is Tanahashi. Okay, yeah. Oh, cool as yeah, hell. Yeah. And my wrestling friend and some other nerds are like, New Japan's where it's at. And I try to watch it where I can. And preparing for this, I was like, yeah, you know, my, blah, blah, blah. so I was finding clips from Forbidden Door. And I was like, this is awesome. What is this? I'm going to pick this one. So, note to self, next, by, ne- time, by next year, I should have watched more pay per views. I forget. Who did Murder Grandpa fight on that show? I forget. Uh, hold up. I'm going to pull it up right now. That name. <laughs> Minoru Suzuki, Murder Grandpa. Murder Grandpa, because he's he's an old he's old. Like John, I kid okay. you not. Like when we say he's old, like he's actually he can he seventies. Yeah, he qualifies for ARP. Like no lie. He was literally. I think it was a young lion, either in the eighties or like the late eighties into the nineties. Well, I saw this. it was Suzuki yeah, it was and Lay Sex Gods. Oh, that's oh my right. God. They defeated Eddie Kingston, Yamono, and Ayuda. Uh, Yuda. Ooh, I he's forgot only 50, about that. He's only 54. But even still, bro. That's young. for Japanese wrestling. That is old as fuck. Because Japanese wrestlers should be crippled by then. Yeah. I think no, he, watch, he's in Forbidden Door. Watching him chop the hell out of Yuta was... That whole pay-per-view, it was hella long with the pre-show too, but it was so much fun. It was worth it. It was so I worth just, it. I did the professional thing and just watched the highlights. I haven't watched a single pay-per-view all year. I just watched the highlights. <laughs> oh, you're talking. You know your shit. Come on. This man's is an encyclopedia. But yeah, I gotta, <laughs> I'll rewatch. I gotta find, I don't, I don't even know where work. I could watch the rest of Forbidden Door. I will give you, like this is, we'll talk, I will, I will give, listen, I kid you not, like when I, we'll talk off camera, but I'll slide you some information. I was just like, I mean, here. <laughs> like, like I said earlier, I might have to start putting people through tables for a check. Do all the research. <laughs> Well, oh my know who you're talking about when you go into these indie scenes. Oh, yeah, and I watched that Suzuki and Lay Sex Gods. Like, yeah, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> Lay Sex Gods. So, yeah, oh, I'm going to mention, how's Jake the Snake doing? And they'll just roll oh. their eyes and kick me out. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Mike is going to slide all that information into your forbidden door. You'll be all set. It'll be good. Oh, yeah. this, Mikey, this is your way in. You figured it out. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. All right, JPL. So let's hear from you. <laughs> Segway. The Segway. I did pick forbidden door. I did not pick forbidden door. As my, that was my second. My best pay-per-view of the year was Revolution 2022. Ooh, that's a good one. Match with the really good prelims and the early matches. And then Kingston Jericho is the opening match. Like, dear. But Hook beat QT Marshall in five seconds in the pre-show. Death Triangle and Eric Redbeard getting the crap kicked out of him in Black Mist by House of Black when they were still badass. Oh, this, <laughs> this is all in the pre-show. I see. And then the ladder match. Like, it was literally Wardlow's coming out party. Like it was huge. That was ginormous. And Dan Housen appearing and like doing the cursing. Dur- oh my God. Like it was just watching all the way through. It was the culmination of the beginning of the year. It got it all set up for me. It did what the rumble couldn't, which was put on this pay-per-view that made sense all the way through. Wasn't too long and really pushed the newer stars, even though they had CM Punk and MJF in a dog collar match. That was back when we liked CM Punk and we wanted MJF to win the dog collar match. That's the one. As I was Even doing the research, I saw a dog collar match, and I watched mm-hmm. said match and was just fascinated by that shit. 
And then there was also, that's Britt Baker versus Thunder Rosa at that point. And then there was also, so I know, Mikey, I think I talked to you about this when we did. This was like second or third of Jade Cargill doing her defenses, and she's getting better all the time. But this was the one where she did her pump kick and nearly drove a Tay Conti's face into the mat because Ooh. it was so poorly timed. That was... was like going, she needs to work on her in-ring work. <laughs> that was so scary. I was like, oh, no. And then we had Danielson Moxley that started Blackpool Combat. We had... Adam Page versus Adam Cole, where you got the let's go Adam chance, which is the best <laughs> thing ever during it. And it was a badass match. Like it was just, that was it for me. That was AEW in a nutshell of coming off the hot year of 2021. This was their big like WrestleMania night and it tore the house down. Oh yeah. And honestly, for me, Revolution was probably the best, mo- like of the four pay-per-views, not counting for Bitter Door, like their four main pay-per-views. Honestly, that's probably the best of their pay-per-views from this year for AEW for me, honestly. I felt it was better than Forbidden Door because one, there was no build to Forbidden Door. And unless you were tied into NGBW, while the work was good, while everything worked really well, if you weren't invested, it was like you had to get into gear to enjoy it. Even though like you had all those amazing matches. Whereas with this, if you're an AEW fan, you're watching the big pay-per-views, you were already invested in everything else. Wardlow had been going on for months and you wanted to see this come. There was so much big stuff in it that you didn't have to work as hard. Even if you hadn't watched AEW, this was a good on-ramp into AEW to get set up going into Forbidden Door. And seeing William Regal with two people for Black Bull Combat, like, that was insane. That's true. So that's my sell on that one. That's my favorite of the year. Good case. I gotta go watch that shit. Yeah, Revolution was a good time. I'm very interested to see what we get at this Revolution, because that's the first paper... The first AEW pay-per-view is March 5th, I believe is the date. Yeah, so we still got a couple of weeks to figure that out. Oh, boy, this is where we're going to get one after Elimination Chamber, too. So that'll be interesting to see what happens with Sami Zayn. So honestly, between now, January, February, March, depend like across all three of the main brands, as I call them, between Impact, WWE and AEW, it's going to be very busy because you got Rumble in january but you also have one of you january is also hard to kill for impact which is one of their big four pay-per-views elimination chamber in february march you have revolution and then sacrifice for impact and then april nxt stand and deliver and of course a wrestlemania it's gonna be good oh i'm so excited that i'm hoping there's gonna be some awesome fun matches which actually leads us to our next portion of this podcast This is going to where it's going to get interesting because we're going to talk about our favorite matches of the year. So just to give a little context for the listening audience, my other co-hosts have gotten a glimpse of my extensive list (laughs) of all (laughs) of my my favorite matches from this year. And there's way too many. And it was hard to just pick my favorite three. Um, I I was watching stuff all afternoon and I'm still like, I mm, I'm going with this one. Go with your gut. Yeah, yes go with yes and. Yes All and right. the gut. Because I asked my co-hosts to pick their top three, but I will just, again, I will be the fearless leader. I will start, <laughs> I guess, I'll just go in order from third to my favorite and then just extensively talk why number one is my favorite. So number three for me was Jordan Grace versus Masha Slamovich for the Knockouts title at Bound for Glory 2022. Jordan Grace is amazing. Masha Slamovich is awesome. And that match was actually very interesting with the build because somebody was going to lose something. Either Jordan was going to lose her title or Masha was going to lose her undefeated streak going into this match because she went into that championship match 20 and 0. Wow. And honestly, they just kicked the crap out of each other. Like Masha's a heavy hitter, lots of slams. Jordan is also known for her power and things like that. It was just two women knocking the piss out of each other. It was so good. They pee in the ring? Good for them. The pee is for pain. Oh my goodness. <laughs> There's pain all over the ring. I definitely recommend if y'all get a chance, find the highlights, watch the match, because that match was really good. Oh, number two good. might piss off a lot of wrestling fans, but my number two is Will Osprey versus Orange Cassidy for the IWGP yes. United yes. Championship yes. match. Forbidden Door. Just because from a storytelling perspective and just performance alone, those two killed it. And honestly, this was my real first introduction to seeing Will Osprey on my on the US TV screen for me. And I have become a Will Osprey fan ever since. Yeah. 
But my number one match of the year, and I already knew this was probably going to be my number one match when I initially saw it on first viewing and it stayed the same despite the year going on. My number one match of this year is FTR versus the Briscoes for the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships at Supercard of Honor. So the first time they faced off against each other in their trilogy this year. My God, if you listen, last year, my favorite match was the Lucha Brothers versus the Young Bucks in the Steel Cage match at All Out. And once again, another tag team match has solidified my favorite match of the year. When I tell you, I've always heard of the Briscoes, but I never really watched their work in Ring of Honor until they started popping up on Impact for a little bit this year, which they were also Impact Tag Team Champions for a little bit, which was an interesting little run. But FTR versus the Briscoes, these two teams just knocked it out of the park, flipping people all over the stuff. Like, they legit had wanted to kill each other like slapping each other, throwing each other into barricades, tables, bleeding all over the place. It was glorious. And then FTR winning the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships. I was like, whoa, this is going to be interesting. And then belt, belt, the start is that the start of the belt collecting or was it like right after that? That's the start of the belt collecting because that paper, this pay-per-view Supercard of Honor was in April. And then they collected the AAA. T- they had the AAA tag team belts at that point. They right. got the Ring of Honor and then at Forbidden Door, they picked up the IWGP heavy t- weight tag team titles. And then, yeah, it was that match was phenomenal. It's my match of the year. The second, the whole trilogy was my personal favorite of this whole year. The second one was OK. It was still good. The dog collar match that happened like last week at Final Battle was insane. Yeah, but. Their first match was great. I did not think would work in a tag team setting as a dog collar match. The double dog collar match was crazy, but yeah. But the first match of the trilogy is my all time favorite, and it is my favorite match of 2022. Damn. Damn. I don't know, man. I love tag team wrestling. You just want to see some good old boys beat up some good old boys. All the beating up of the boys. (laughs) In dog collars. Mm-hmm. You know, if, out of context, that sounds like some weird BDSM shit. Isn't it though? That's not, that's not what it? we're talking about. Oh, it's my bad. It's not a threesome. It's not a threesome, right? It's not a threesome. Is that, is that what you're? Sure. Is that what you're saying sure that, while it's happening? It's not a threesome. It's not a threesome. That's yell, like yelling no homo. Seriously, uh, <laughs> different podcast. Look, podcast. I, I'm just surprised that everyone's so surprised that pro wrestling isn't so homoerotic, and it's literally built into it's right it. there. It's right there. Let me get all rolled up in speedos and rub on each other. It's right there. Ric Flair is called the Nature Boy. It's right there. It's right there. But yes, Mikey, that's a great pick. That is an amazing pick for a match of the year. That's awesome. Yeah. So now I throw the reins over to whoever wants to go next. <laughs> Same order. Sure. Why not? <laughs> okay. Number three. My number three was actually it was Orange Cassidy and Will Osprey. That was my number three. My number two, I might get some hate for this one, but I think this one match was actually like super entertaining for what it was. Stone Cold Steve Austin, Kevin Owens at WrestleMania 38. <laughs> that match was entertaining as fuck. This is the go kart one. And this was the last one anywhere. Oh, where he was driving him around yeah. in the ATV, right? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, okay. I think. Yeah. Him over, yeah. And the bumps that Steve Austin was taking at his age were just fucking awesome. <laughs> True. He um, amazing. And this one, it was a, it was, it was, Ric Flair, Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, Andre. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, that match no, was terrible. No. If you watch an old man get the shit kicked out of him, watch that match. That match was well, in the ring three times. Oh, that was hilarious watching Undertaker and Mick Foley. Just the pure disappointment in their faces watching that match. Bret Hart actually looks angry. If you want to watch old people get pissed off at another old guy, that's where you watch. My number one match was uh, Seth Rollins versus Cody, uh, versus uh, Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania 38. You almost said Kenny Omega. <laughs> and so I was like, wait, that would, oh, that would, oh, that's a dream. I want to watch that now. But yeah, again, the torn pectoral match. No, the uh, at the, WrestleMania the, when Cody returned, that was yeah, actually his, a his banger return. match. That was a banger match. <laughs> you knew it was coming because of him leaving, but at the same time, I was like, this. They had picked like a perfect opponent for him. Can I ask honestly why it's better than the Hell in a Cell match in terms of like why you like it better? Because I like returns. 
Okay. Seeing people come back to form, like my greatest. I mean, I was a huge John Cena fan as a kid. As a John Cena, what am I saying? Huge John Cena fan as a kid, but like the whole thing Edge he did, but watching Edge return in 2019 brought me to tears seeing him come back. So I just love good returns, so I love Cody Rhodes coming back. Hell in a Cell match was also fucking incredible. I don't know, because if I think about it personally, like I'm looking at it like, yes, the return was humongous for Cody and it was great to see. I feel like the match worked better somehow, even with the torn pectoral, it was smoother, cleaner, and more intense in the Hell in a Cell than it was. Like You could tell that Cody had been off for a bit and there was a little bit of rust there and Seth carried him a bit. Mm-hmm. So just look at the thing overall with the buildup. I feel like it would be, but that's my personal opinion. I see why you would love it and that's why I wanted to get clarity. Yeah, I just wanted the spectacle of just seeing him come back and just the inner, like, after watching wrestling and everything like that, sometimes it's just the entertainment. Yeah. That's hence why I like the Stokos Steve Austin Kevin Owens match because it's just purely entertainment. But it was also uh, Oh, it was incredible. And if I want to watch like good technical wrestling, that's where the Orange Cassidy Will Osprey matches because Kenny Omega didn't really do much this year because of being injured and then getting suspended because he got bit by a dog. Ace Steel is definitely a dog. Funny how that yeah. happens. Yeah, people get getting so. Like- but I mean, his the match with the Elite versus Death Triangle that match that happened before that was really good. Yeah, because they're all I, just great wrestlers. It makes sense to me. I just wanted to get clarity because I was sitting yeah. there going in my head. I'm thinking about like it wasn't the best match, but I can see that with the with everything tied into it. Yeah, it was just seeing Cody Rhodes because I've watched Cody Rhodes when he first started in WWE and seen him come back, start AEW, do crazy all this crazy stuff, and then come back as his American Nightmare character after his fall from grace from leaving WWE the way he did. The neck tattoo. Yep. And see him come back, and then the reception he got. This is all cool seeing that. And not a lot of people come back from a neck tag, too. That's really hard. that's really hard. It is tough. Yeah, and he it's off putting because that's the only tattoo on his body. But no, he's got his dad right here. Oh, that's good. That's right. A dream. That's the only reason you knew who who what was it? Fuego, Fuego del Sol two was when he was dressing up in the lucha mask. <laughs> Fuego del Sol. <laughs> it's really funny. Oh my gosh! I loved, I loved that so much. I shouldn't have, but I loved it. But yeah, I just want to throw some shade at that Ric Flair match, too, because that match was fucking hilarious. That was awful. <laughs> Something be so bad, it's good in wrestling. <laughs> hey, like, is that also, awful? makes it hilarious, it's a Jim Cornette production. Exactly. Meanwhile, Ricky Steamboat's going to outshine him in his match, and he's it's just, again, furthering that whole rivalry that he's better than Ric Flair is. That whole entire event was so weird because there was actually some stellar matches, but they were all really short. Because they had to give time for Ric Flair to die on the canvas. From the walk is old ass because you know how long his entrance takes. Und- like, the that- Undertaker may be the only person with a longer entrance than Ric Flair. What if we find out years from now, like he was supposed to die in the ring and they botched it? Like they didn't bleed him enough? Supposed- he wasn't there. He was supposed <laughs> to die in Carolina in the ring and they just forgot to kill him. Ric Flair would die in one of two places, in the ring or inside a woman. That's, that's just... Oh that's my time. gosh. <laughs> Both at the so, same time. So, Professor, are you saying that basically someone thought that Jay Lethal's name meant that he's also a hitman and was going to take out Ric Flair in the ring because his last name's Lethal? Not real? It's not oh. real? Oh my gosh. What do you mean? I cannot. <laughs> All right, before we keep... So, who wants to go next? I can speak real quick. I didn't have time to pick a third. But all of mine are being mentioned, so I will mention them. My number two was the double dog collar match, because that was insane as I started watching that and hearing and digging up a little dirt on it. What? How did they create this one of this? Really wild shit in there. And as a horror movie person, I respected it. But as a a choreographer and someone trying to be safe, I was like, oh, I feel gross inside. But it it just looked so good. The ref was not even safe. The ref is bleeding. Like, you get blood. Like, everybody dying. Yeah. My my number one is the Cody Rhodes Hell in a Cell. Nice. Uh, Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins, because it's just the stories leading into that. Everything that I was picking apart as I watched it. If you've ever had a torn pec or know anyone who's had a torn pec, that kind of a muscle injury thing, it's... If it happened that close to the match, like they're saying, that's ridiculous. Like his life is on the line. That's a blood clot waiting to happen. Like and he's saying that, saying that he can't do any more damage. He can make the bruise worse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, big time. And so what I really, I watched it twice. And the second time I just watched the arm. And he like, got can't, beat up. Can't use his arm. Seth beat the fuck out of that pack so too. Seth, Seth carrying Cody to a degree, still selling that whole match. There's two moments, if you watch them, I don't have timestamps or anything like that, where Cody kind of forgets he can't use his right arm and, pu- and throws a punch at Seth. 
You just see him go, well, boom, that was stupid. And the air comes out of his body. And he still sells it. And every time he hit that crossroads, he was in ridiculous pain. Every time he did the reversal, that you knew he was in pain. Every little jab and jar. Seth trying not to totally crush him with that no stick, like rock him, really trying, but not hurting. Just the whole time, I was like, oh my God, the heart and sort of the storytelling of that moment and the other thing in there. Um, getting off his coat. Hey, what? After the entrance, when he's trying to take his coat off and he can't get it off his can't arm. Can't even take off his coats. Like, it, he's holding up the belt. And he can't whip him because it would hurt too much to whip around and do the things or just throws it on the ground. Yeah. Goes to pick up the sledgehammer and goes, nope, too heavy. Puts that. Like these moments of, ah, oh, you're just seeing someone go through it. So between that and what I saw in Forbidden Door and all the names I don't know from Forbidden Door, I could have picked any one of those two and just been like, yeah, that's cool as hell. But that one really, friggin' bull rope. Like, yeah. going into an old school bull rope match like that is just... Ah, I adore that. That got me back into, okay, I need to start watching more, more of this stuff. Nice. All right, so I'll go into my thing here. I have an honorable mention because it didn't happen in 2022. It was right on the cusp of it, and it's one of my, it's, you want to talk about bloody matches that surprised the hell out of you. My honorable mention was from, it was the December 29th. I think it was a Rampage or it was a Dynamite. It was the Bunny and Penelope Ford versus Ooh, Ty, Ty yes. Mello and Anna J. Yes, that match was great. <laughs> That one led the year in. That ended the year 2021, and it has to be an honorable mention because it's not 2022, but that you want to see people go balls to the wall that you didn't think were the toughest or anything else on this and just crush it to the point where Penelope Ford's neck gets crunched in that table twice with a pile driver. It's like, how the hell did they pull this off? And that wasn't the main event. That was that was so good. That's my honorable mention. And go back and watch it if you haven't seen it. It is ridiculous. I'm I might be crazy. We were recording stuff at this time. Is this we've talked about this? I've talked. I think we probably have. This we might have. Twenty ninth last year. It might have been doing like our first or second episode of Friday Night Fights. Yeah, yeah we had been talking a chunk about this, and I was like, "That sounds ridiculous." What are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> so good, and it's so well worked. And putting the Queen Slayer on with a barbed wire around her arm, and oh. My- <laughs> Honorable mention, I had to bring it up because I couldn't talk about it last year. It's one of my favorite matches of all time. Like, I love that match. My number three this year, my number three this year was John Moxley versus Wheeler Yuta on Rampage. When that made Wheeler Yuta this year, like the blood, everything else, getting the BCC put together, watching Yuta work that match and like really work that underdog fire against Moxley, who's beating the living crap out of him. Hands down, amazing stuff and made his year this year. They got him where he is. So big there. Number two was Cassidy Osprey. Again, not only the work rate, not only the NGPW, watching comedy wrestling at its best with, with, with Orange Cassidy, who I've been a proponent of since day one. Like, I love good technical wrestling, and he's an amazing technical wrestler. I love good storytelling, but this year for me was like the year of comedy wrestling. I loved everything in there. Dan Housen showing up. My heart, so good. Who This is me who loves... Abaddon and like House of Black. I love Orange Cassidy and Danhausen. Give me them all the time. So that's my number two. My number one this year was from WrestleMania. Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. You want to see a spot fest and you want to see somebody who understands the business, how it works, gets the good stuff in, but still makes a full on production. That is a WrestleMania match. That is what you're looking for at WrestleMania, and that was Sami Zayn starting his year off right to where he is now as the MVP this year. It's in. I, go back and watch it. They got the damn handover from Jackass. I don't know how they pulled that See, out. See, anyway. I watched it, and maybe that should be my number three because I watched that and I couldn't stop laughing. Like I thought that right. was Dude, incredible. Right. We man made that match fucking awesome. <laughs> Deep fucking body slap somebody. Oh my god, <laughs> that made me think of oh. old Hornswoggle days. Honestly, what was it? A A Tyson Kid in the Rumble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know what's even funnier about that is two days before Brock Lesnar put We Men through a table at a restaurant. I remember that. <laughs> so oh, great. Right, that's right. Honestly, because no. like, I had watched this back to back with my friend, and because we both talked about it afterwards, it's like technical wrestling. We had our favorites, but that was our match of the night. Honestly, for WrestleMania Night Two. And honestly, overall, for us watching both back to back, we agreed that night two overall was probably the better of the nights from yeah. us personally. But that match was ridiculous. There was so many spots. It was a production. But honestly, it turned my, 
Yeah. <laughs> Sammy was game. Johnny was awesome. And Sammy protected the hell out of him to kept him going on there because there were yeah. a couple of really scary spots. Nothing. Uh, one of the year. I wonder if that's the only times that I don't want to say Johnny Knoxville ever looks afraid. And I don't think that he's scared in the ring. I think that might be some of the moments where Johnny is fully aware of his mortality. Yeah. As opposed to like almost dying because of a bull or actual shit that put him in the hospital for six months or eating butter bean and dying basically. Yeah. Like in, in the ring, I think Johnny has that sense of, I could die right now. You just know. You're right. And well, with their experience the last time they were as the jackass guys with Chris Pontius and Sivo getting the crap kicked out of him by Umaga and then having all that problem with it, like the, the, going back and actually working with WWE was huge. Oh, Steve-O it, fucked it up because he was high as a kite and wasn't paying attention. Exactly. It was like, lay down, don't do anything. And Umaga was like, every time you move, I'm going to hit you. Yeah. Honey has figured it out. steve -O's just, I'm going to sell it. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> Jeez. Umaga but, is terrifying. Honestly. That's right. some, those are some really good picks. I like that. We had some similarities over top three, but I liked how every match we had as our favorite was different from different promotions. Really quickly, before we go into the next tough topic, some honorable mentions because I narrowed it down to top 10, but I was like, I only talked about my top three. Listen, I watched a lot of wrestling and this is where people are either going to like or hate me as a co-host after this. So here we go. So you already know my top three matches, but going from the list from 10 to four, my honorable mentions. Number 10 was Mox versus Yuta on that rampage, which made Yuta, which was great. By the way, his matches with Daniel Garcia, they each time they face each other, they got progressively so much better. And I really enjoyed their match that final battle this year. They're going to have an amazing down the road when they take a time off and they come back to it. They're going to have the best wrestling matches out there at this point. Yeah. Number nine actually comes from NXT. Surprisingly, I think you're the only one that liked anything from NXT this year. That's because my number nine pick was Nathan Frazier versus Axiom in their third of the best of three trilogy that third and final match between the two was banger i wish that they got more time because it was only like 10 minutes i think but even still they those two can always go at it and i enjoyed the trilogy as a whole but that third match was really incredible i loved it i still hate the fact that they put a stupid luchador mask on a kid but whatever <laughs> And they stole the whole gimmick from somebody else. So Yeah, I'm just like, the whole superhero gimmick is mass luchador thing is stupid, but I can't take yeah. away a kid. I can't take away a kid's talent because that kid, I really enjoyed him in NXT UK and I hope they utilize him because he's fantastic. Are Number team him up yeah. with scripts at this point now with the two superheroes, him and scripts. <sighs> oh my, please don't put that out in the universe. I'm happy to see Reggie back on my screen, but I'm like, this whole scripts thing is stupid. Well, why are they doing superhero stuff and not getting hurricane where is hurricane I, honestly, Shane Helms everything we, about him oh my I'm goodness Molly. oh listen, yeah listen oh my goodness but anyways yeah so number eight was the fatal four-way for the inaugural AEW transatlantic championship between Pac Miro Malachi Black and Clark Connors that the match was that are no longer working that much and then Clark Connors, I had I had no idea who he was, and I was like, oh, he's the person from New Japan that everybody's gonna beat the shit out of. And then towards the second half of the match, like I they made me believe I was like, oh shit, he has a shot. Yeah, and the fact that he the fact that he was only in this match because he replaced Tomohiro Ishii because Ishii was sick and he couldn't be a part of this match. No, he got hurt. He got hurt, not sick. He got hurt. His right, knee. Because Ishii had beat him to get this match or on television. Yeah, Clark made me a believer, and Pac winning was great. That whole match was actually really good. Oh, Pac. Pac's so good. Yeah. He's such a bastard. So, number seven might yeah. be a head-scratcher for some people who don't follow Impact, but number seven is Mickey James versus Deanna Perazzo in their Texas death match at Hard to Kill this year. That match was amazing. Like, Mickey James, the champ, for taking a guitar across the face, and just... The two, Deanna has done so good after being released from NXT. I will say taking a guitar to the head is not as painful as it seems. I have done it in I'm school. I'm getting stuff in my eye. That is true. Yeah. But that whole match was good. And then just the thumbtacks, the chairs, them just chilling each other. Honestly, that match was really good. And Mickey retained her in knockouts title for that. So that was a lot of fun. Which, by the way, I'm very interested for 2023 because Hard to Kill is going to... I'm interested to see how Impact books that main that women's main event, but we'll talk about it in a little bit. 
Number six is the fatal five-way ladder match at Stand to Deliver for the North American title. Carmelo, Cameron, Grayson Waller almost dying was amazing. <laughs> when he jumped out that ladder, I legit, like the way his arm bent, I was like, oh, that man is dead. <laughs> yeah. And he saved himself, luckily, but yeah. I was a little upset because I was like, Solo didn't really do much in that match, but it was okay. it was fine, whatever. But that match was great. And Cameron Grimes winning the title was awesome. It was about time. At that point, and now he's off my TV. Number five is Swerve in Our Glory versus the Acclaim for the tag titles at All Out. Like, when they did the rematch at Grand Slam, it wasn't as great. That first match, I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But they made me believe in the acclaimed at All Out. So many close finishes and pinfalls. A lot I'm of just scissoring. Like, a lot of scissor me, daddy ass. It's like, the fact that... <laughs> What's up, John? What's up, John? I walked into that. Hurry yes. on. Yeah, that match was fantastic. And it made me believe that the acclaimed could win. And honestly, they should have won at All Out, if I'm being completely honest. Because at that point, the crowd, they were so over with the crowd was behind them naturally. And honestly, they should have won at All Out. I'm glad they got the titles at Grand Slam, but they should have won at All Out. That's just me. And then, of course, number four, I talked about it earlier, so I don't need to go into too much detail. This one was tough, but Bianca versus Becky at SummerSlam for the Raw Women's title it was great. But those are my honorable mentions. It was. I only got great. one, and it's Survivor Series War Games of the Bloodline versus the Brawling Brutes. Dude, that's the storytelling in that match. Uh, <sighs> that's so what good. made it so damn good. And watching Solo just kick the fuck out of four people at the same time was awesome. Yeah, it was amazing. Are you supposed to pick a tag match? Because I totally forgot. <laughs> no, we were just talking about honorable mentions. <laughs> okay, I came back and I was like, oh, I did not study for that test. I don't have it. The only one other one I could think of if I have to pick an NXT match for some, something like that, which I don't usually do. I really enjoyed Breaker, Dragunov, J, uh, JD. Even though I hate JD McDonough as a person, he's a horrible human being. But that match was a really good triple threat. It was really good. I actually I was surprised at how much I enjoyed that.